I'm Charlie Coker, Executive Director of Asia Society Southern California. Welcome to this evening's program, the Chinese Film Market 2021 and Beyond, where we will delve into the world of, of Chinese media. Um, we're very pleased this evening to have um, uh, Josh Hu with us from Hawaii Brothers, as well as Stephen Salzman, who will be moderating the conversation. Stephen Salzman is a member of Asia Society Southern California's um, advisory board, as well as um, co-chair of the uh, US Asia Entertainment Summit and chair of the Governance and Nominating Committee. Uh, Steve is a partner at Paul Hastings, as well as, well as the Asia and Europe Media and Entertainment Chair, uh, and a very good, good friend and a dear colleague, and we've worked on a lot of crazy things together. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Stephen Salzman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlie. Um, and thank you again to Asia Society for putting on this program. And most of all, thanks to Josh Yu, who I am about to interview from Y.E. Brothers International Limited about what's going on in China and specifically with YE. Um, but first, uh, a little pleasure. Uh, I think we'd like to introduce to you a couple of trailers from upcoming films from YE and their collaborators. So uh, first uh, trailer of Extinct, followed by the trailer of Cherry. Have you ever seen one of these before? Bubbles. Oh, probably not, because they went extinct in 1835. Extinct? Do you mean? Uh... Um, right. But to save their kind, we're the only ones who can save the plumbles from extinction. They need to travel through time. The answer to all your problems is right through here. Got a great feeling about this. Do you trust me? No. Let's go! Oh! Some writers of The Simpsons and the director of The Simpsons movie. How do you got me into these things? Oh. So Get ready. <laughs> so oh. For a whole new world. Oh, hey, isn't this place great? No, it's too dangerous. You just don't think things through. One of these days, you're going to get someone hurt. Just eat me. Let Ed live. Or alive and smell like Cyclops breath. Hmm. And by the way, you have a cavity. We won't let you die, brother! Oh, guys, 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 it's just a donut! We're pretty delicious. I'm 23 years old and... Sometimes I wonder if life was wasted on me. I take all the beautiful things to heart until I about die from it. If I could save time in a bottle, the first thing. Hey, I'm really happy you're here. Why is that? Because I like you. But there never seems to be enough time to do. You're it for me. I know the same way. I joined the army. Why would you do that? Sometimes I feel like I've already seen everything that's gonna happen. <laughs> and it's a nightmare. My one true accomplishment was not dying. I have this noise in my head. It'll stop. One day it'll go quiet. I don't imagine that anyone goes in for a robbery if they're not in some kind of desperation. I've been at this a while now, and it's no secret what my face looks like. Get on the ground! One thing about robbing banks is you're mostly robbing women, so the last thing you want to be is rude. Ma'am, it's nothing personal. I 
we're gonna make it through this. I love you. Can you look back to when you met the one you loved the most? Can you remember exactly how it was? What you saw in her that made you say yes. This is what I came here for. Sometimes I feel like I've already seen everything that's gonna happen. And it's a nightmare. Well, that's going to be a tough act to follow. Um, a little bit of something light, and then uh, obviously the prestige film, Cherry. So I've had the privilege and the honor of working with Josh Yu, who currently serves as the general manager of Wai Brothers International Limited. And we've worked together on many projects over the years. Josh manages Wai Brothers overseas assets, developing in-depth cooperations in Hollywood, in Asia, he oversees their acquisitions, their co-financings, international sales and distribution for both Chinese and English language films. The recent executive producer projects include the phenomenal Netflix action thriller Extraction with Chris Hemsworth, the movie that we just saw the trailer for, the Russo brothers film Cherry, and the first South Korean sci-fi project called Space Sweepers. So hopefully we'll see coming to a theater, uh, coming to a theater near you soon. Obviously those words have changed in our vernacular, which is a nice segue to the first question that I have for Josh, uh, Josh which is the impact of COVID. Um, with certain pockets being exceptions from time to time, China is more or less back to normal, but COVID nevertheless brought about changes to what was already a dynamically changing media landscape. So Josh, what do you perceive as the near-term changes? And do you also foresee any long-term effects of COVID? Okay, um, thank you. First of all, thank you, Steve, Charlie, and Nature Society for having me here. And um, Steve, for your first question, I think it's a very timely question and very good question at this moment. So speaking about the near-term change, I would say it's mainly reflected from the distribution channel of uh, films. For example, in China, I think that a very obvious case of the near-term near change is that um, for last year's Chinese New Year release period, like one of the films were, was released on um, by dance on streamer instead of uh, going into the cinema, uh, which is lost in Russia. So because of the occupancy rate restrictions and um, the people's confidence of going into the cinemas, I think a lot of people choose to watch films on, stre on streaming platforms instead. So that is a quite obvious change in the near term. But what I'm interested to talk about is more of uh, the long-term changes. I think the long-term changes will be reflected from several aspects. First of all, um, I think Chinese filmmakers have been thinking about what kinds of contents they will be developing and will be producing. So um, I think by starting, I will be giving you several numbers. Uh, if you're looking into the marketplace in China and also in the United States, I think they, the two markets share the same changes um, in the past five years. So in China, we may, we may have approximately 800 films um, be released every year. But if you look into the market as a whole, like the top 20 box office grossing projects, they take up almost 50% of the market shares. So that's a very intimidating number. And that number is still like going up. So that means, you know, um, most of the projects staying in the theatrical releases will be those tentpoles, franchises, and big production with big production budgets. 
So that's、um, the thing that we have all been thinking about,、um, because apparently theatrical release will be remaining there. In this case, we have been thinking about、um, what kinds of contents we shall be、uh, providing and producing to the cinemas. And、um, I think the structure of the lineup will be changed in the long term. By long term, I mean in the coming um, um, five to ten years.、Um, as a as a film company, we have already been restructuring the lineup、uh, on a yearly basis, and we'll be we'll be developing and producing those ten post、uh, franchises to for theatrical releases. And on the other side, we have been thinking about. Producing and developing, you know,、um, mid and small production budgets, films, for streamers instead, and that's the first change I will be foreseeing. And the second change will be that uh, uh, I think it's a it's a phenomenon everybody is talking about. Last year, I mean, in twenty twenty, that is theatrical release going to die, but. Apparently, my answer is no. I think theatrical release will be remaining in place. So that means we have to find a way how we can coexist. I mean, theatrical release how can be coexisted with streaming with streaming services, and that's from the distribution channels. And、um, if I think if com If film companies like us、uh, have been thinking about to restructure our lineups, that means we'll be providing different kinds, different genres of contents to different、um, to different distribution channels, and that's the second point I want to mention. And at the same time,、um, we have,、uh, as a company、uh, in nature, we also have to think about、uh, what kinds of production budgets. We have to include in on our annual lineup and annual slate, because、um, normally for those temples,、uh, it normally takes like、uh, two to five years to develop and produce before it can even go to the cinemas. But and that will be affecting the cash flow. That will be affecting the overall operation of a company. So speaking about this, I think another change we might be foreseeing is that how we can、um, we can better adjust the financial structures of a single project, a single film project here in China. Because in the past we see that,、um, for example, like for those homegrown projects or for those controlling, we we call it controlling projects. We normally control. More than fifty percent of the equity structure of a single project, but that is very different from、um, those more mature markets like the U.S. and like South Korea. For example, like in South Korea, normally a controlling project by a film company, the film the company only invests twenty percent to thirty percent of the equity structure. But in China, we invest over fifty percent of the of the structure. So that will be directly causing the cash flow problem if the project is not be released on time or on schedule. So from a from corporate level, I think you know uh, uh, every company shall be thinking about how we can better adjust the,、um, the 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 governance mechanism or adjust the、uh, financial structure of uh, uh, of film projects. So those points are what I can foresee in the long term, and actually, you know,、um, despite、um, the if effects brought by, by the COVID issue, I think we are working down the way towards that directions. But I think the COVID issue only accelerates the process and accelerates the thinking、um, for all of the companies here. So, if I'm understanding correctly, Josh. Not only will you be producing for producing different types of content for different distribution channels, and I think the emphasis is on the bigger budget, higher production value franchise type movies, hopefully still for theatrical release. Whereas 
mid budget range, quote unquote, smaller films being made for the streaming platforms, does it affect your overall size of the slate? I mean, understanding you're looking at the structure of each film, you're looking at the different channels, but does that mean your overall slate might be fewer than it normally would be in light of this impact or would it roughly stay the same? I don't think it will be affecting the number of the films be included in the annual slate. I don't think that will be affected, but I think the proportions will be changed. For example, like the proportion of different genres, the proportion of different scale of production budgets, that will be changed. Got it. Do you think that you will also, in light of what you were just saying, that there will be an attempt to further diversify the equity structure of the Chinese films and seek greater investment as opposed to that 50% threshold that you mentioned? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, yes, I think that's, a, um, that's an interesting direction we are exploring right now. So, for example, like uh, taking Hua Yi as an example, like the company I'm working for, in the past, we always use our own cash flow to fund the film projects. And that, you know, that means the money will be staying there for like three years until the film is released. And then until a settlement comes up and we can finally recoup from the waterfall, right? So that's the traditional way of uh, financing the projects. But for now, I think, and for now and beyond, I think, you know, we are, we are thinking about how um, we can make a healthier financial structure for the films. For example, like in last year, we collaborated with China Merchants Bank that they, 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 they facilitate, a, you know, um, a, a credit for us, which we can um, utilize for film development and the pro, uh, productions. And that's what we contribute in as a proportion uh, in the financial structure of a film. Uh, so that is something new in China because um, never has a bank ever done this before. Um, that's, one, that's one thing. And on the other side, you know, we also syndicate with strategic partners. For example, like the online ticketing platforms, um, like Maoyan apparently has become, you know, the largest film company in China to some extent and in a way. Um, and also like we have to collaborate with those, um, uh, those distribution partners who can help with the marketing and distribution of the of a project. So that is the that is the point I'm talking about uh, as to how we can, you know, make our financial structure more healthier and more um, more strategically important. And so you mentioned as part of that and as part of that entire shifting ecosystem arguably the acceleration of the dominance, the importance of the streaming platforms. Are you seeing that the streaming platforms in China are now contributing to that financial structure in a similar fashion to Netflix? In other words, ordering a series and actually you know, agreeing to pay for it over time, uh, ordering a feature length film. Um, is that model translating to China as well in light of this impact? Um, the answer is yes and no, uh, at this moment, I would say. Um, so answer is yes, because um, uh, from the distribution channel, if, if we purely looking at the distribution side, yes, it is the same fashion as the US platforms do um, at this moment. Because the, for example, like the whole back periods uh, from special release to SVOD release has been shortened to significantly. And um, that is yes, but I'm saying no because um, the major difference or the biggest difference right now uh, between the streamers in China and uh, streamers in the US such as Netflix and Amazon um, and a Apple TV Plus, um, I will say like unlike Netflix who not only do a lot of acquisitions and um, you know, buying from those independent studios, um, they also like has uh, abundant, you know, um, uh, uh, projects in its pipeline, which means they have a lot, they have a big number of uh, homegrown projects. They, they, they have the capability and they have the experience of developing and producing contents themselves. And that is very different here. 
you know, most of the Chinese, you know, platforms, even though we can name easily, you know, three to five major platforms right now, that they mainly do co-financing and um, acquisitions from studios like us, but they are lacking the experience and they're lacking their own in-house manpower to, um, to incubate their homegrown projects. And I would say, you know, um, it's still some, uh, I think it's still a long way to go before uh, they share the same fashion as Netflix does. Understood. Uh, and mm -hmm. obviously that's, that's, that's a critical distinction in terms of the way that they're operating. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously one of the other factors that, that has come about are all of the COVID safety protocols, for example, which right. increases obviously the budgets. I'm assuming that you're grappling with the same issues in terms of production COVID safety protocols and processes that you have to go through in order to make sure that your production is as safe as possible. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that's increasing costs, what companies like YE are doing about that? Uh, first of all, I don't think you know the COVID protocols will be necessarily um, increasing the production budgets um, of, uh, of projects. And I think the main effects brought by the COVID protocol is that you know, a lot of productions have been postponed or um, they're taking a longer period of time to, um, to, to, um, to finish or complete the production phase. Uh, so for example, like we do right now have um, three projects in shooting um, in China and we don't see a uh, inflating uh, production budget. But instead, you know, uh, you have some um, hundreds thousands of COVID tests on set and you have to coordinate with the um, relevant, you know, um, uh, 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 government organs to facilitate a smooth production phase or, um, uh, uh, or uh, so um, to some extent, I think it's, um, it's making the production phase longer than before but it's not that significantly affected, negatively affected, I mean. Um, so I would say um, things are not, things are, things are mainly back to normal. Um, um, the only thing is like, we have to very, very closely monitoring, uh, monitoring the, um, the, 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 the health of uh, uh, every single staff on set um, of the crew members um, and also uh, we have to be very smart of choosing the locations we are shooting because, uh, for example, like in China, like different local governments, they have different policies implemented to prevent the spread of COVID. So um, like in winter time, especially when we are facing low temperatures, like in northern cities here, like they are facing um, more challenges to some extent, you know, rather than the southern cities. Like, so, uh, for example, like in the, among the three movies we are shooting right now, like two of them are happening in um, southern cities in China, only, with only one happening in the north because that requires snowy things. Um, so we have, to very be, we have to be strategically smart of choosing the locations of shooting. And um, also, that also depends on, you know, um, uh, that also depends on the local government policies, yeah. Right. Yeah, so, but once so again, Hainan, Hainan is, Hainan is uh, likely to become a very popular yes, production destination. Yes, um, yes. Semi, you know, tongue in cheek, but also semi seriously, Cannes has now been apparently rescheduled for July. Do you mm -hmm. plan on attending? Well, uh, <laughs> I think as a person who is in charge of flights and international business, I, of course, will be attending if the travel policy permits. And as a, as, a, as a person who's in the business, you know, I do, I think I share the same feeling with my colleagues. So we do miss Ken, we do miss the market, miss our friends and partners uh, who will be attending Ken every year. And I miss my meetings, you know, from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. And, uh, but, but in general, it also, it, it all depends on if we can all work together to control the spread of COVID and if the travel policy permits, as long as it permits, I think we'll be there for sure. So despite COVID, YE released the 800 globally mm -hmm. last year. 
and it became the highest grossing film in China of 2020. And this happened after some delays in its initially scheduled release date. Um, so perhaps you could give us some insights into this ultimately incredibly successful project, but also some of the challenges that it faced. I will say more challenges than, than the exciting insights because you know uh, it's never easy journey to release this title. First of all, um, even though we see a very pleasant you know result out of the release, which is now surpassing like 460 million US dollars in its global box office revenues. Um, um, this film like takes 10 years to develop and produce. Um, you know, um, honestly speaking, I'm not a main contributor to this project other than, you know, distributing it internationally, you know, in over 30 territories. It's a record breaking number for Chinese language projects. So, um, so Guan Hu, director Guan Hu and his team uh, started developing the story, the, the concept of the film like 10 years ago. And then, you know, uh, one five years ago, Guan Hu joined Huayi um, as a contracted director and, uh, you know, um, he brought up the project to us. And um, um, the shooting itself, it's never easy to take place because um, he replicate the sinks, I mean, the Suzhou River and the banks on its two sides. Um, on a one-to-one -one scale um, in our Suzhou theme park, which we own the, land, uh, the piece of land. And um, I think it took like um, almost a year to build the set. And because a lot of things were taken, were, 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 were shot actually uh, overnight. So electricity was, uh, was the biggest problem, I would say because uh, it needs a lot of uh, power to support the electricity needs during the shooting. And um, so after the completion of the production, uh, as, uh, as you all may know that it took uh, one more year to release it in theatrically. And the, the time we, cho we, we chose to release this title was very special because it was amidst the pandemic um, during the first outbreak in China. When we first released the title, actually the restriction on cinema occupancy was, was no more than 30%, as I can recall. And later on, um, during the release, um, the restriction was, ra was raised to 6%, uh, what was to raise to 50% and then to 70%. And it would have stopped at 70% of, of the occupancy restrictions. And back then, another very terrifying number for us was that um, actually the market size uh, during that time was only something between 7%, 17% to 21% of the same period as compared with 2019. So that means with such a high production budget film, the break even point in box office revenue is very high. And we were all, we were all uncertain uh, whether or not, uh, you know, it was, it could ever reach that number. But um, it turns out because we have confidence in, in its quality of production and in, in its, um, in, in the quality of the storytelling. Uh, so um, luckily, you know, we happily see the result coming out as of o over like 460 million. Uh, but that success, I think, was extremely important to Huayi, to not only Huayi, but also to the whole uh, industry in China. Uh, because first of all, it helps a lot to, uh, uh, to solve the cash flow you know, problem of why at that moment. And we, you know, we, we, soon, uh, we quickly recouped from its waterfall, um, our, our large number of, uh, you know, cash flow, uh, which helps the operation of the whole company. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that, um, you know, because uh, back then, uh, you know, 800 was the one of the first films uh, who got released after the pandemic. Uh, 
before that, you know, the cinemas have been closed for um, over half a year. Um, and then, you know, 800 was the biggest um, film to be released in cinemas. And I think that, will, that largely helped the um, reboot of the, um, of the cinema business and also of the film business as a whole. So that's the second point, I think, which is very important um, of the success. Um, and, and, uh, but personally, I would say the, the most important point of the 800th success was that um, it, it, it helped, um, you know, um, you know uh, Chinese filmmakers like us to find back the confidence in the marketplace and in our business. Um, I think it's a success. It's not a success for Huayi as a single pro, uh, as a single company. It's a success for all of the filmmakers in China, because I think we worked. We all worked together to facilitate its release, and we we uh, you know all of the audience they contributed the result. They gave they give the confidence to all of the filmmakers here. Um, so um, I think, you know, we always own our sense to the audience and to the market itself um, of, you know, seeing this success. Yeah, the, the, the rising tide lifts all boats, so to speak. That's right. Um, That's... And, I, and I think, yeah, I, I think that confidence level in, in, the, in light of the pandemic was extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, Prior to the changes that were wrought by COVID, we were mm -hmm. already dealing with a very turbulent situation uh, brought about by both regulatory changes within China in the film industry, and of course, then the ensuing trade war initiated by the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about how these factors influenced YE's business if they did? Um, uh, yeah, I think it did affect our business, especially our international business. Um, the, the the very direct effect from the turbulent the turbulent time was that, you know, um, one thing is of course for the, um, the, the the trade conflicts between the two nations um, that makes us less confident in uh, doing acquisitions and doing co financing projects. But we never give that up. Um, that's one thing. And the second thing is that uh, 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 I think companies in China, like us, you know, who have our business, uh, who has been in its international expansions or uh, in in other formats of international businesses, uh, that will be reducing our confidence level in terms of uh, uh, being that proactive international landscape um, so that's the main effect I saw but on the other side I would really argue that uh, I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing for um, to some extent because uh, um, uh, well let me put this in this way uh, let, let me just give you an example like uh, uh, when especially Back in 2015, tw some some uh, sometime between 2014 and 2017, I would say when we saw a swarming of uh, external capital into China's film business, uh, for example, like um, real estate companies, they have been investing in, in in film business, and a lot of other industry, they have also also been swarming into our business, and all of a sudden, seems like, you know. Uh, people in the film business, they felt they were rich and they went to different film markets and they fit with high prices, with, you know, astonishing prices for, for, for imported films, for co-financing opportunities, especially for those studio, you know, temples for hot properties. And, but for example, like they, they spent like millions of dollars on one, acquisition and then can never be broke even in the Chinese marketplace. But I would I will not say that that's a healthy approach to do business in this way. So after the 
trade conflicts and after certain you know regulatory um, restrictions, I would say you know to some extent it's, it's helping the business to go healthier, to right. to to put people in rational thinking of uh, how much we should spend on different kinds of projects and you know win-win situations always help promote partnerships and always you know uh help with the system sustainability of uh of, of the business so uh, i would really argue that you know to some extent it's helping the business to be healthier um to be more sustainable um uh into the future right Right. It, it helped to rationalize the business and, right. and to right. decrease the amount of so-called hot money that was coming into mm -hmm. the industry, um, which makes a lot of sense. Do you it was also a time, though, not only of, um, you know, uh, confrontation uh, and awkwardness in terms of U.S.-China relations, which will hopefully be dissipated. We can all hope. Fingers crossed. But it was also a time of seeing greater regulatory changes in the ecosystem within China, tax enforcement, uh, regulation of budgets. Um, so mm -hmm. this was also a time of internal change. Do you foresee more regulations ahead in terms of coming from uh, the government within the film industry? Or do you think that that wave has now kind of settled? Um, I will be go for the latter. I think that that wave has kind of uh, settled right now, because um, as may, you may know that you know uh, there were several regulations in um, um, that have been put in place um, to um, to um, to to make the business more uh, rational as well, uh, you know, in the local market. Um, it's the same thing, like when when we saw. Um, the increasing hot money because i hate using the word of hot money because i would say you know a lot of uh, um, you know external capital um, uh, then uh, the production budget was unnecessarily brought up to a higher level but that's not healthy um, not only for those acquisitions and co-financing international projects uh, if we only talk about local productions we see the same problem like Production budgets go higher, higher and higher, and um, production but production companies uh, we face you know more and more pressure of uh, 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 you know of seeing success uh, commercially. I mean from the uh, uh, profit level, uh, profit perspective, um, it's 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 harder and harder to break even, and um, that's uh, I think that's a uh, that's not a healthy. Um, circle um, that we want to create uh, in the business. Um, so the regulations we saw um, in the past few years, um, that helps with two things. One is the, uh, the healthier ecosystem I just talked about. And the other is that I think it's to some extent forcing filmmakers to think, um, to, to refocus on the quality of the productions uh, uh, instead of purely, you know, making money out of um, productions. So that means, uh, uh, to some extent, I think it forces us to think about, uh, to emphasize uh, uh, the thinking of uh, what kinds of contents we want to create and what kind of contents will be uh, good in the long term for uh, for the business and for the market as a whole. Um, so the two things um, I saw from the uh, regulations you mentioned um, that have been put in place in the past two years. But I don't, I don't foresee uh, at this moment, you know, um, the upcoming uh, 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 regulations. Yeah. So, so notwithstanding this challenging environment, um, YE managed to uh, seed fund the Russo Brothers production company, obviously mm -hmm. the engine behind the trailer of the film we just saw, Cherry, um, and, you know, spearhead a new company for these two very successful directors. Um, mm -hmm. Perhaps you can talk a little bit about how that came about and what the results have been for you so far. 
Mm -hmm. We actually started talk, talking with the Russos uh, when, they, when they were promoting uh, Avengers 3, I think, in China. And uh, it was such a coincidence um, that we share the same idea and of the same mindset of what kind of company we want to be. Um, so um, I think by then they have already finished the shooting Avengers 4 and um, they have been thinking about, they want to create a company um, that produces and develops um, the global temples, uh, feature films, uh, franchises and elevated genres such kinds of contents. Um, and they want to um, be the creator of those contents within their in-house power. And coincidentally, you know, we share the same idea as a company who have been in China for like more than 25 years. We also want to uh, uh, create a company or fund a company uh, which is focused on, um, you know, global temple franchises, um, production development. And before that, you know, why international business was mainly focused on single project acquisitions, single project co-financing, and we were just in the middle of uh, completing our, you know, 18 film deal with STX. Um, but that's more of, uh, you know, slate investment or, uh, you know, financial investment. And then we, back then we were thinking about um, as a content house in China, uh, if we want to expand our business into the international marketplace, uh, we do want to keep our DNA and we would do want to um, create um, the contents by ourselves together with, um, you know, the most wanted creative personnel uh, in Hollywood. So that's the reason of, uh, you know, uh, uh, founding the company um, together with the Russo brothers. And of course, like uh, my predecessor, Fleece B, who used to head white international business, she contributed a lot to, uh, uh, to sealing that deal uh, with the Russos. And um, with, but, you know, um, I'm very happy to see that after three years of uh, uh, the company, company growth, we have now seen um, a series of uh, successful cases, uh, no matter in TV drama production, uh, or in uh, full feature development and productions. So um, just to give several examples, as Steve, you have uh, you know, mentioned in the very beginning that um, you know, the phenomenal uh, production of Extraction starring Chris Hemsworth, Hemsworth um, directed by Sam Hargrave, um, that project is actually a record-breaking uh, project for Netflix. Um, you know, for now, I believe over 100 million people have watched um, extraction on Netflix. Uh, and that was only, you know, uh, debuted on Netflix uh, uh, last April. So that is one of the successful uh, projects we uh, made together with the Russos. And also like the, um, as all of you have um, seen the trailer for Cherry, um, that is a crime drama uh, picked by Apple TV Plus. Um, that, that is the first directing project for the Russos after the Avengers series. And um, that also sets a uh, record-breaking acquisition price by a streamer, uh, you know, of its kind. And, um, uh, and, and also, like, I'm very happy to tell you that it will be debuted on Apple TV Plus um, uh, on March the 12th. Uh, you know, it's coming up very soon. Uh, that's also a successful case. Uh, and also, uh, on the other side, we do present it um, uh, to Netflix that um, uh, action, uh, action, you know, drama uh, called Mozo uh, that was uh, debuted on Netflix last November. So we have seen a series of uh, completed projects already. But what's more exciting for me is that going forward, we do have a uh, um, very attracting pipeline in place, and we will be seeing the um, coming up of uh, excited, you know, a, a very exciting projects in the uh, coming year and the years to, uh, and the years to follow. And I think one other success, cross-border success that you can point to mm -hmm. was your company's significant contribution to the financing of Roland Emery's Moonfall, um, a project which managed to commence production last year 
in Montreal <laughs> in an increasingly worse COVID situation um, with obviously many participants bringing that to fruition. Um, again, perhaps you could share with us a little bit about how this came about, how the COVID related risks were addressed given that it started its production in the late fall of, of last year. Um, and, and just how this project surmounted what appeared to be almost insurmountable obstacles to come together. Mm -hmm. Well, um, that is indeed a very, very special experience for all of us who are working together on MOVO uh, because we do have finished, we have just finished the production phase um, of the project, you know, uh, during the most difficult time, during the, um, during the peak of the pandemic. Um, so uh, actually we came across this project um, uh, back in Cannes uh, two years ago when we met Roland Emmerich and his team and we were uh, very immediately attracted by the story. Uh, you know, he wants to tell. And uh, also it's the, it's the, it's the sci-fi adventure story that uh, Roland is, you know, is back directing. So when we first decided that we want to, uh, uh, we want to do this project, um, immediately we faced the challenge brought by the COVID. And um, actually the first commencement date of the photography was set um, in last April um, instead of October. And just because of the outbreak of COVID in Montreal, Canada, um, we, we saw the restriction of, uh, you know, filmmaking um, by the local government. So we have to postpone the, uh, we have to postpone the uh, commencement date. And that actually brought us further challenges in terms of the film financing and uh, um, everything before we can even start the shooting because, um, a lot of companies and a lot of people actually they are lacking confidence because that was a new thing back then you know uh, nobody knows when the pandemic is going to be over or nobody knows when the when the markets globally will be back as normal so um uh, and, and also like that's a very big production budget film and uh we we, we faced you know further challenges brought by the delay of uh, commencement of photography um, in terms of uh, financing, in terms of uh, finding the right crew, in terms of keeping Roland's, uh, you know, wanted crew members. So those are all of the challenges that we have to tackle um, at one time. And then um, luckily, you know, um, with the help of, uh, 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 of the company, of my company, and also with the help of uh, our partners, we do like, we do, um, we do feel very lucky that we, we, we did fulfill every, every single commitment, you know, um, uh, as a production company, as a co-financier, um, as to um, get the film started. And um, so after, you know, half year efforts, um, uh, I would say very strong efforts, um, uh, we did successfully um, started shooting um, in last October. And uh, now we have happily seen the wrap up of the film and it's going into post-production. Um, uh, uh, but, you know, during the, during the uh, process of uh, the film shooting, uh, film, filmmaking, um, I think, you know, uh, um, led by Roland and his team, uh, we did accomplish uh, a miracle as I want to put it. Uh, not to mention that, uh, you know, hundreds million, a hundred thousand of uh, COVID tests that have been done on set um, for all of the crew members and all of the casting members. Uh, we also like um, collaborated closely with, uh, with the insurance company, with, you know, uh, um, with, with the local government in Montreal, in, uh, you know, uh, in Quebec and with um, the banks, with, uh, with, with with all kinds of institutions to facilitate a smooth, uh, you know, shooting, shooting phase. And also like, at, you know, um, and also I will, I will be taking really taking the chance to, to, to extend my thanks to 
all of our partners, including, you know, of course, your team, Steve, uh, Paul Hastings team, and um, our, our time honor partner, East West Bank, and uh, the insurance company, and of course, like the Roland SKS team, a lot of, you know, help we have received during this is very special experience to make it happen, to make the miracle happen. Uh, and um, yeah, now let, let's just look forward to the release of this project. Well, thank you for that nod, Josh. Thank you for the kind words. And yes, that was a, a group effort by everyone that touched mm -hmm. the project. And so I am sure I'm confident that it will be the success that everyone is hoping for uh, and was a minor miracle to get achieved. Mm -hmm. um, Let's hope so. Yes, we, we've talked a little bit about the transactions between China and the US, the UK, uh, because Moonfall obviously had a, a UK production company. Um, mm -hmm. You've also been doing some interesting things within Asia. Uh, for example, you've done a recent deal with CJ in Korea. And so perhaps you can talk about that collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I think Hua Yi is, uh, is always very proactive in the Korean markets. Um, uh, uh, um, and uh, for CJ, because CJ is a huge, you know, uh, it's a leading M&E uh, company in South Korea. And we always adore their success in filmmaking and, um, uh, and in the diversity of their slate. Uh, you know, they develop and produce all, kind, all different genres of films. And uh, a lot of them turned out to be uh, you know, uh, huge successes in the marketplace, including the Oscar winner, uh, you know, Parasite, uh, and many more to come. Um, so uh, we did we did forge a, a strategic partnership with CJ, uh, you know, uh, with first look in their um, uh, 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 co-financing opportunities and of uh, um, the China distribution uh, opportunities as well. Um, and, and I believe that, you know, uh, we, uh, we uh, both of the companies, we look forward to working together to, uh, to, to, to produce, you know, uh, more films in, in, in South Korea and also in China. Uh, so that is the, um, uh, yeah, that is the partnership we have forged with CJ Entertainment. Uh, but uh, apart from CJ, actually, we, uh, we do have, uh, 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 you know, other projects in place um, out of the Asian markets. Um, for example, like uh, uh, CJ Affiliated, it's a Thai remake of a very classic CJ movie. Uh, it's called Cl Classic Again. It's a love story. Um, and um, we will be distributing the Thai remake in China uh, for CJ. And um, uh, on the other side, um, uh, I think Steve, you have also mentioned the uh, South Korean sci-fi project. It's called Space Sweepers. It's actually a large production budget, uh, relatively speaking, in the Korean filmmaking history, and um, it's the first. It's the very first sci-fi project um, uh, uh, in South Korea's filmmaking history as well. Uh, and we. Um, got on, on board this project from the very first, the very, very beginning, you know, from the script, you know, uh, 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 when, they, when, when the director and when the producer were uh, started to develop the scripts and uh, we became the co-production company and we became the um, co-financier of the project. And of course we have the distribution rights in China uh, for Space Reapers uh, as well. And, um, and also, I'm happy to share that, you know, uh, Space Weaver was just um, debuted on Netflix several days ago. And uh, from the result um, so far, uh, uh, we are all happy to see that people like it and the audience uh, find it, you know, um, uh, visually stunning and, um, you know, uh, and also they love the story as well. So um, those are the projects we have uh, uh, participated in the Asian market, other than the Hollywood. I'm just curious about uh, mm -hmm. in collaborating with CJ, um, mm -hmm. is that going to be purely for Chinese language and Korean language films, or will that also encompass English language films so that you would actually have a Chinese company and a Korean company 
collaborating on producing effectively, quote unquote, Hollywood product. That will be also encompassing uh, English language projects, right? But with a focus uh, on Chinese language and the Korean language. Right. And I still mm -hmm. think that that's a fascinating development where you can have, obviously, right. a powerhouse Chinese company, a company like CJ, collaborating to produce effectively what one would consider otherwise to be Hollywood product. Um, that's right. Before we close out, um, one of the things that I obviously know mm -hmm. is how diversified a company YE is. It's mm -hmm. not only vertically integrated in the film industry in terms of film, television, production, distribution, even some cinema ownership, um, but it also is a company with investments in gaming, in sports, in fashion. Um, so do you see any of these particular sectors as future growth areas for YE? Given you know the emergence of esports, um, what sectors do you foresee as growth sectors for this diversified company? Mm -hmm. um, Steve, actually, that's a very good question because that's the question we have been discussing in the past few years. Um, so uh, we did, you know, uh, uh, we did we, we did upgrade upgraded um, our strategy um, as from the corporate level back in 2014. Uh, before then, why it was purely, uh, you know, uh, uh, a film company. And then uh, we uh, stretch our business into theme parks, into um, uh, consumer products and into, um, you know, uh, gaming, um, gaming business. Um, but uh, apparently we faced uh, very serious um, challenges. Um, as many people know um, that, you know, um, the cash flow problem, the um, operation um, uh, challenges we have received, in, in, uh, especially uh, in the past two years. And so that made us to think about how we can, uh, you know, uh, usher into the future. And I will say, um, um, content business will be remaining the core business of YE uh, because that been, that's the driving force of the uh, merchandising sectors of the theme park sector. Um, we have to enlarge the sourcing for um, content development and the productions. For example, I, I think gaming is also, a, uh, is, is also one of the sources. Uh, for example, like in the coming Chinese New Year release, we do have one project to be presented to the audience, uh, which is called the Yin Yang Master. It's actually an adaptation from a very, very popular games in China by NetEase. And gaming is an important source, um, and it's a double channel, I would say. Um, and also esports, uh, we do have an affiliate, uh, which is the largest esports company in China, um, the, uh, VSPN. So uh, esports is also uh, important sources of the contents. Um, and apart from the content business as the core business of YE, we do believe we will be uh, further developing the um, other sectors, for example, um, the theme park sectors. For now, we have opened several locations in China already, including the Hainan, Changsha, uh, you know, um, Jinan and Zhengzhou, uh, you know, uh, uh, projects. Those movie towns and theme parks have already been opened and we see um, pleasant results already. And I think that's something, you know, uh, uh, that we, we will be able to keep um, the contents uh, through an offline formats, um, uh, through the location-based entertainment um, you know, formats. Uh, so that's one of the sectors we will be keep doing. Uh, and that sector is currently headed by our chairman, um, Dennis Wong. And other than that, you know, we do have uh, uh, other, you know, uh, related companies like uh, the gaming companies or the esports companies, and also uh, merchandising, the consumer products uh, partners. Uh, I think that is also one of the uh, uh, expanding business, uh, you know, apart from the content itself. 
So um, in general speaking, generally speaking, I would say uh, we will be keep being a diversified entertainment company uh, with a core in content development and productions and uh, with a stable output um, of uh, uh, slates on a yearly basis. So Josh, uh, I think we've been given a little bit of additional time. So before I ask mm -hmm. you one of my, my closing uh, questions, uh, mm -hmm. I'm gonna pose to you a couple of questions that have come in from the audience. Um, oh, one sure. of which is, is about the animation industry in China. Mm -hmm. um, your views of that industry um, and do you feel that producers in China will focus on collaborations with foreign partners uh, looking for foreign IP or do you think they will focus more on local IP and local productions in the animation space? Mm -hmm. I would say both. I would say both. To answer this question, I would say um, uh, uh, we're looking at both possibilities um, because, you know, relatively speaking, I think China's animation markets uh, is relatively less mature. That means uh, we see the lack of talents. Uh, we see the lack of animation companies here. Um, um, uh, but I think animation is always an important component of the content business. And especially for Huayi, why, you know, we are proactive in animation production is because, you know, uh, other than its importance to contribute into the, um, you know, um, overall slate, it's also an important factor that we can uh, utilize the animation animated projects into theme parks and into consumer products, uh, the merchandising businesses. So um, as we may see some of the successful cases in animated features in China, like um, uh, it con consists of uh, both possibilities, as you, um, as the question states. Like one is the local, the local story, the local stories, like Nerja, the you know the highest box office grossing animated feature, and also Jiangxia, uh, the animated feature we saw last year, and those are the successful you know uh, stories based on local local ideas or local cultures. But we also see successful cases um, which Chinese companies collaborated with for, uh, foreign companies with Hollywood, you know, uh, studios to, for example, like Kung Fu Panda is one of the best examples to, uh, to prove in that regard. And um, to, um, you know, to moving forward, I think uh, uh, Chinese companies uh, who have anima animation business uh, we will be also looking into two possibilities. Taking Huayi as an example, like Extinct, um, the project, the, the trailer we showed in the very beginning, that it's a collaboration of Hollywood team and China team, and it's a universal story. That's one, that's one of the possibilities. And the other is like, uh, uh, you know, uh, we also like work with local um, talents um, to um, develop animated features inspired by um, Chinese cultures, uh, by an element from the Chinese cultures, or by a uh, um, you know, um, local idea or local story. So um, I will say like, I see the emerging animation companies in China, but I will say uh, we welcome, you know, um, uh, an increasing number of animated, uh, you know, animation companies um, to be participating in the business. Um, to enhance the capability and to increase the number of uh, animated projects here in China. Makes sense, makes sense. Mm -hmm. What, uh, another question from the audience, basically looking to have you uh, do a little bit of forward looking into the co-production scene, um, mm -hmm. notwithstanding the tensions that have arisen, the complications, um, do you see this as a fruitful uh, area for investment of time, capital, resources, et cetera? Uh, that's really a tough question for me because, you know, um, I've always been thinking about uh, how we can move forward with co-productions. 
Um, I would say co-production is relatively more difficult than um, um, than purely purely English language projects or purely local productions. The reason is not because of the regulations we have to go through, um, uh, not not because of the co-production proceed, uh, you know, the um, the procedures we have to go through, but but the real difficulty lies in the difficulty of uh, how we can travel um, the culture and how we can convey uh, one culture to another. And um, unless you can find a universal story that can travel freely you know, uh, across borders. Um, otherwise, I would say uh, the, the script writers, for example, like the script writers or the two production companies we really have to spend tons of time um, before a script, a, a, a script can, can even come into force. Like we have to spend tons of time discussing, you know, debating um, on um, how we can tell the story and from which angle or uh, uh, what message we have to convey through the storytelling that can convey the message to both um, both the audience in, in, in bo to both markets. Like, I think that's the real difficulty. Uh, why, uh, as you may know, that a lot of co-production projects fell apart um, you know, midway or um, before it can even um, complete the scripts. Um, um, and also that's the challenge we have been tackling uh, on our daily life because uh, we, we never give up, you know, co-productions. Uh, on the contrary, we are very proactive in seeking co-production opportunities with, for example, with our, with our, you know, um, uh, 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 joint venture with Russo Brothers. We have always been discussing about uh, whether we can work together to um, co-produce a future film um, that works for both markets in the United States and in China and even globally. Um, and we are discussing with South Korean company like CJ, with uh, like, you know, um, uh, like Merry Christmas, the production company of Space Reapers. We have also, also been discussing with them um, uh, in which way we can work to make, you know, uh, co-production work uh, and easier to achieve. So um, that's the challenges I see out of co-production opportunities. But yes, I think that's also an important component, component of uh, international business uh, moving forward. So one last question before, mm -hmm. before we leave. Um, aside from eliminating COVID, if there was one thing that you could change in terms of the current media landscape, either in China or globally, what would it be? What would you want to change? Uh, <laughs> um, I want to change. Um, can I can I answer from different perspective? That sure, you know, sure. Um, that's not what I want to change. But uh, I think I want to answer like, what is the other factor that may be directly changing the landscape of the media business here? I would say it's the talents. I think I think it's it's a very pleasant thing that we see the emerging talents, especially in recent two years. Like we see first-time directors, we see first-time you know script writers, we see first-time actors, actresses. I think they are the forces changing the landscape. It's not what I you know what what we want to change, but they are changing the landscape right now. They are bringing. You know, new ideas. They are bringing new methods of filmmaking. They are bringing, you know, uh, new approaches of, uh, you know, working together um, to create a story. Um, um, and luckily, you know, uh, we see a lot of uh, right uh, increasing cases, uh, increasing successful cases by those first-time directors. They are not professionally trained. Um, by a film academy uh, or so, but um, they do have very interesting ideas. They do see, you know, the everyday life differently. They perceive the world differently. And um, 
they are making the film differently. Some of the films are even made by, you know, on their iPhones or on, uh, on you know, um, on, on not that, on, on not that, you know, um, high, high profile, you know, um, equipment. But I think that's the interesting thing. That's the, I think uncertainty is the beauty of the business. Uncertainty is the beauty of the, um, uh, of the thing we are all passionate about. Um, like I think the young talents, the emerging talents, they are changing the landscape in China. Um, uh, and um, personally, I'm very happy to see that happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's an incredible dynamic. I think obviously what you point out, emerging talent, first timers, um, young people with a very different perspective, not right. even necessarily professionally trained. It leads me to one quick follow-up question though, which is in light of that, short form content. Um, we've seen obviously the past year, the demise of Quibi. On the other hand, we see mm -hmm. what's happening in the world of social media, TikTok, et cetera. Um, would there be room for or a pivot to the creation of more short form content within the YE portfolio? Mm -hmm. So before answering your question, Steve, I, I do have one interesting add up to the previous question. Um, I'm sure. saying that, you know, the emerging talents, you know, people not professionally trained in the film, you know, um, academies, they are changing the landscape. Uh, just to give you an example that, you know, uh, director Guo Fan, the director from um, The Wandering Earth, uh, which is a huge success of the first, you know, which is labeled as the first Chinese sci-fi, uh, you know, film. Uh, he actually went to law school. He used to be a lawyer before he became a director. So see how- So you mean there's the hope, business. you yes. mean there's hope for me. <laughs> Uh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> maybe, maybe we can work with you for the, your, you know, for your very first projects. So <laughs> that's a very interesting example to prove that you know people uh, from other business, from other professions, they can also you know, you know um, produce very interesting and very successful uh, films. And answering your question, like I think it's also a very close question at this moment, especially at a juncture uh, which we are uh, coexisting with streamings. I mean, the traditional theatrical business is coexisting with streaming services. Um, we do have short form contents um, that in pipeline um, within the white system. And for those short form platforms, it's very interesting, interesting from two perspectives. One is that, you know, uh, we work with extremely young talents, especially for those um, uh, university students, college students, um, and, and also, even we work with, you know, high school students um, on those short form um, uh, videos because they want to create a content that is for the leisure time, uh, uh, for example, for delivery, for delivery guys, for office workers during the break of office hours. And they do have that passion and enthusiasm for um, creating those kinds of contents. And that's one interesting perspective. And the other is that, you know, for those short form uh, videos, short form contents, uh, we collaborate with almost um, all of the uh, uh, streaming platforms in China, uh, including, you know, Bilibili and including, uh, you know, uh, uh, ByteDance, including uh, TikTok, the TikTok version in China, uh, Douyin. So we are developing and producing um, those short form contents in Hawaii as well. And we see that as an intrinsically uh, important component of our overall you know, content, uh, uh, content scope. Thank you. No, that, that, that also makes obviously a lot, a lot of sense. So we've been at this for uh, well over an hour. And so I appreciate Josh very much that you have indulged uh, and given us this time. And so with that, and thank you for your time, your insightful answers, um, and I'll turn it back to Charlie. Thank you, Steve. Thank you to Josh and Steve for an amazing discussion about the China market and, and, and why you grow this one of the preeminent uh, filmmaker and companies in um, China today. Um, we just wanted to thank everybody for joining us for the evening and, um, uh, and Thank you for, on behalf of Asia Society for joining us. We also would like to let you know that um, we're, there will be other upcoming programs this month. Um, we will be um, on February 22nd 
there will be a, uh, a program uh, on our continuing series about COVID-19. Um, there will be uh, on the medical divide. Um, that will be featuring um, the Dean Michelle from, Dean Michelle Williams from the Harvard School of uh, Public Health, as well as uh, Connie Jo Chung from uh, the Asian Americans Advancing Justice. We also, in the entertainment world, we'll be following up with another program um, of Asia Society at the Movies, which premiered on February 1st. Um, our next installment uh, currently is based, will be on Friday, March 5th, um, which, where we'll be screening the um, China submission um, to the academies for consideration. Uh, the movie Leap, um, discussed, uh, which was a biopic on the famous uh, Chinese uh, volleyball coach, Lan Ping. So we hope to see you there. Um, we hope, also hope that uh, you will become a member of Asia Society in Southern California and consider donating to, um, to Asia Society as well. We make all these programs free and so if, to the public. And if, uh, if you enjoyed the program and would like to support the continuation of our abilities to make programs like this, we hope that uh, you will join us and, and consider donating. Thank you very much and have a good evening.